Thanks very much, Stefano, and uh, thank you for uh, the invitation to be here today and, and uh, talk to everyone. Um, so my talk is, is going to uh, touch on, on some allergen issues, in particular the issue related to thresholds and thresholds uh, and their potential for use in health risk assessment. Um, I don't have any disclosures uh, for this talk, um, so uh, quickly I'll go through the organizational structure where I work. Um, and I'm going to do a bit of background on health risk assessment, and I'll try and go through that fairly quickly uh, because I think the more interesting stuff uh, is some of the later slides um, where we get into the idea of predicting severity of response, um, uh, the challenges that we face uh, around the issue of setting regulatory thresholds, and, and a little bit about consumer perspectives because I always like to try to remember that the reason we do this is uh, to try to improve things for people with food allergies. And, and that's really the bottom line. Uh, so uh, I do work at Health Canada in something called the Health Products and Food Branch, uh, the Food Directorate in something called the Bureau of Chemical Safety. And in the Bureau of Chemical Safety is where we deal with a number of different uh, food-related safety issues, um, in particular um, the issue of food allergens. So, like I said, I, I'm going to go through some of this risk assessment stuff fairly quickly. Um, the idea is uh, that your risk assessment is made up of two components, the hazard assessment and the exposure assessment. Um, when we're talking about a hazard assessment for food allergies, uh, the things that we have to consider are, first of all, which food allergen is present in the product and really is the amount of protein from the food allergen capable of causing an allergic reaction if it was ingested by someone uh, with a food allergy. Um, when we're looking at what amount of allergen someone would be exposed to if they consume a product, uh, we look at various factors. Uh, has the presence of the allergen been confirmed using analytical testing? If so, how much allergen was detected? Uh, sometimes we don't have analytical results, but we have a situation where the allergen was actually part of the product formulation. In that case, we can do some math and, and estimate again how much allergen would be expected to be present in the product. Um, and then based on the serving size, uh, we can uh, come up with uh, an idea of how much someone would ingest. So at Health Canada, we haven't set absolute threshold levels for food allergens uh, for a number of reasons that are going to be discussed throughout this presentation. Um, what we do tend to use for our health risk assessments are information on low L's or no L's for allergens, um, and that can tell us information about how much someone has reacted to um, in controlled studies. So this table is just sort of an example of low L's that have been reported for various food allergens in published studies. Uh, a colleague of mine at Health Canada, Sebastien Lavier, put this together a few years ago. Um, I guess the important takeaways here is you can see that in some cases there's really wide ranges of low L's, so different people are reacting at very different doses. Uh, but you can also see that at the bottom end of the range for those low L's, um, people are reacting to quite small amounts of allergens. So the other side that, that I mentioned for the health risk assessment is the exposure assessment, and this is the idea of how likely is it that someone with a particular food allergy is going to consume the product in question. Um, this can be a challenging uh, thing to do. Uh, we look at a lot of different factors. Uh, we look at how much of the product is available on the market. Is it something that's been produced in large quantities or limited production? How widely distributed is the product? Is it only available in, in locally or is it province-wide or national distribution? Um, so we try and get as much information about distribution as we can. Uh, we look at how long the product has been in distribution. Um, and then we look at things like whether the presence or possible presence of the allergen is identified on the label of the product. Obviously, if it's in the list of ingredients, then we don't have a problem. But when we're looking at foods, it's, you know, sometimes it's not identified in the list of ingredients, but it might be in a precautionary statement, like a may contain statement. There might be a picture on the label, even though the ingredients aren't correct, that might give someone a clue that they should be avoiding the product. 
So basically we're looking at any information about why the product would be likely or unlikely to be consumed by a person with a particular food allergy. Um, you know, if there's an allergy-free statement or gluten-free statement on a product that turns out to be incorrect, obviously that's going to be a more significant issue. Um, in some cases, we have contamination with a food allergen where the allergen is whole and clearly visible. So something like sesame seeds on a bun, um, as long as they're on the outside of the bun and visible, then that would be considered a significant mitigating factor because we would expect the person with sesame allergy to see that and avoid the product. So the final risk characterization considers both the hazard uh, posed by the product and the likelihood of exposure. Um, and we put those two things together to, to develop our risk assessment. Um, in Canada, we sort of have three levels of risk assessment. So health risk one, two, or three, where health risk one is the highest uh, level and uh, two is kind of medium. And health risk three is usually something that's not very significant, but where there might be uh, some kind of labeling issue with the food. Uh, sorry, I guess I should have went to that one. Okay, so uh, I think moving on, like I said, to the, I think the last few slides are going to be the more interesting ones. and, and this is uh, where we start introducing the idea of predicting severity of response. So one of the challenges that we do have uh, for health risk assessments for food allergens is something that's already come up. It's the idea that the hazard actually varies from one individual to another. So one person can have a severe reaction at the same level of exposure that another person might have a minor reaction or even no reaction at all. Um, you know, we can say that the higher the level of allergen that's present, the more likely that it will provoke a severe allergic reaction on a population basis. But at the individual level, that becomes much more difficult to do. And the real question we ask ourselves here is, is it possible to predict a threshold value that would only trigger mild reactions and would never be associated with severe allergic reactions? Um, so there was a, a publication by Zoo in 2015 uh, that looked at a number of different food allergies. Uh, so they were looking at uh, uh, eliciting doses for peanut, milk, egg, and soy. Um, they did find some correla correlation in the peanut. Uh, so in, in the peanut, allergic patients who experienced severe re reactions had a higher minimum eliciting dose and threshold distribution doses than those who experienced mild or moderate reactions. But they didn't find any significant differences in threshold distributions according to the severity grading in milk, egg, or soy. And they concluded that, um, or, or they noted that severe reactions occurred in some patients at low minimal eliciting doses for all of the food allergens, including peanut. Um, there was another recent publication that looked at uh, a number of different factors which might predict severity of response for an allergic reaction, uh, again in individuals with allergy to milk, egg, peanut, cashew, or hazelnut. Uh, so uh, this was a publication by Peterson. Um, in this study, they found that the eliciting dose only contributed 4.4% towards the predictive model. Um, so it wasn't a strong predictor of severity of reaction. Uh, they concluded that the eliciting dose obtained from a graded food challenge should not be used for the purposes of making risk-related management decisions. So we know that individuals who react at very low eliciting doses can have severe reactions. And unfortunately, uh, this data doesn't allow for the determination of a threshold below which only milder reactions will occur. So this brings us to this idea of setting regulatory thresholds. And, and I do get asked, you know, why hasn't Health Canada set a threshold level for allergens? And so um, I, I'm going to try to get into that a little bit and explain some of the challenges that we're facing with this idea of setting regulatory thresholds. So we've already heard a bit um, that there are uncertainties related to the data on thresholds. Um, there's difficulties related to combining data from challenge studies that use different protocols. Whether we look at low Ls or at ED values, there's a very wide range of individual values. Um, you know, individuals can react at very different levels. Uh, another point I wanted to mention are that, that 
we're starting to notice more that external factors can have significant impacts on individual thresholds. Uh, so things like exercise, uh, use of different drugs, uh, infection or sickness, sleep deprivation, all these things, uh, and I, I noted a publication uh, by Dua in 2019 um, that, that showed significant impacts on individual thresholds um, just based on, on those different uh, factors. So on the other side, we also know that there's uncertainties related to analytical results. Um, just the methods themselves can have significant analytical uncertainty. Uh, the issue of sampling becomes very significant and uncertainty around sampling, uh, particularly when you're dealing with something like cross-contamination of a food allergen into another food. Uh, it's generally not homogeneously distributed, so there, there can be pockets of allergens in there, and whether or not you're going to catch them when you do your analysis, um, this can become another significant challenge. Uh, the last bullet, uh, you know, is the idea of how would regulators deal with an adverse reaction that was reported in a food that contained less than the regulatory threshold. So if a regulator set a threshold, um, and you know that uh, you're setting a threshold where at least mathematically there are some people out there that can still react and potentially can still react severely, so would it be possible for a regulator to set a threshold when you knew that was still a potential? Another question is really how would thresholds be perceived by the food allergy community? And again, this goes back to something I said at the start. We always want to remember that what we're doing is supposed to help make things better for people with food allergies. Um, however a threshold would set, uh, there would be the potential for very severely sensitive individuals to react at levels below this value. Um, so we know with low L's it's possible that there could be individuals out there that weren't involved in the studies that could be more sensitive. When we talk about an ED value like an ED1 or an ED5, these are values where we're actually predicting a certain percentage of the allergic population is going to react at that chosen level. I think that many people with allergies are likely to believe that they're among the most sensitive individuals. So if you started talking to them and said, we're going to set a threshold level, and that level is going to protect most of you, um, in fact, it'll make things better for most of you, you'll have more certainty, but a small number of you are still going to be at risk, and you really won't know, looking at the label, whether you will be or not, uh, I think that would be difficult for people with allergies to, to understand and, and to deal with. You know, I think, like I said, a significant percentage of them may think that they're in that really sensitive group, even if you explain to them, no, no, it's only the 1% that's most sensitive, but they don't know their individual values. You know, at least in Canada, we're not doing that kind of, of challenge studies to tell people their individual values. And again, even if we did, those values can change over time. So, uh, you know, my concern here is would thresholds make people with food allergies feel safer or could it actually have the opposite effect? A really highly related question to this issue of thresholds is the use of precautionary allergen labeling. So if we were able to set a regulatory threshold, that could be used by food manufacturers to make decisions about whether or not to put a precautionary statement on their foods. And the idea would be that if you tested your food and you had a level above the threshold, then you put the precautionary statement on, the may contain statement on, and if you knew you were always able to keep that level below the threshold, then you wouldn't have to use precautionary labeling, uh, and you would leave the precautionary labeling off the product. Um, at least that's the, the idea, and, and it's something that's been talked uh, about quite a bit lately, and, and whether or not it's possible to set that kind of threshold. So the concern here really is that it's a lot easier to use thresholds to define situations when precautionary labeling should be used than it is to define situations where it should not be used. So it's fairly obvious that if you set a threshold and as a manufacturer you test your food and you find a value of uh, an allergen and it's above that threshold, well you know you have to put a precautionary statement on that food. But if you're doing some testing and you find some positive analytical results, 
but they're always below the threshold level that's been set. Given all the uncertainties we've already discussed around sampling, analytical uncertainties, that manufacturer might still choose to put a precautionary statement on the food. There's also this issue that I refer to sometimes as sporadic cross-contamination. So you can have a situation where you get cross-contamination occurring every once in a while in a big lot of a product. And the example I've uh, given here is almond slices in a breakfast cereal. So if uh, a manufacturer is making one breakfast cereal that contains almond slices and then they're using the same equipment to make another product that doesn't have almond slices, those almond slices can get hung up in the equipment somewhere. Every once in a while one might shake loose and get into the product that's not supposed to have the almond slices in it. So that's a known situation where manufacturers can use these may contain statements. The concern becomes, you know, when it's there in the one box that has the almond slice in it, that's a hazard. And if someone with an almond allergy gets that box, then they could have a reaction if they don't notice and, and, and eat that almond slice. But there's a real question about, you know, what percentage of the product has to be affected before you would put a precautionary statement on the food. If you know that only one in 10,000 boxes is going to be affected, do you still put the may contain on? You know, what if it's one in a thousand or one in a hundred? I think that becomes a tricky question even if we had thresholds for allergens. So just before I conclude, I think um, I'd been asked to, to come up with um, a couple of sort of takeaway messages. And um, let me see if I can find them because I know I wrote them down here. I just didn't get them into the slides. I think the real question of what's being discussed comes down to this issue of acceptable risk and what's going to be an acceptable risk for the food allergic consumer. We know that if we try to achieve zero risk, then the threshold is always going to be zero. So we know that we can't do it that way. But at the same time, you know, What's the acceptable risk to allergic consumers, particularly if that risk includes the possibility of severe allergic reactions? Is it okay to set a threshold that 1% of the allergic population is expected to react to, even if we know that most but not all of those reactions are going to be mild? And the second sort of takeaway message goes back to those allergic consumers and you know, thinking carefully about whether having allergen thresholds would be beneficial to allergic consumers, in particular the way that uh, they hoped that it would be. Thank you.